My name is Heidi Bell. I work for um, Nesta, which is the UK's uh, innovation foundation, where um, a lot of the work that we do is about innovation in public services. Uh, we're based in the UK, but we have global networks. Um, and this concept of open innovation sourced um, from a wide crowd with diverse expertise is a subject certainly close to, close to our hearts. We're involved in net many um, projects which look at citizen-driven innovation in, in public services. Uh, one of which is the Code for Europe project, which has been um, talked about a little already today, involving how you can take disruptive technologists into city halls around Europe to look at the development of new um, apps and services to solve um, kind of really crunchy and user-centred um, uh, needs in cities. We're here today uh, for a panel discussion about the concept uh, of city as a platform, a concept based, based on the notion that city can really only be smart um, when it's um, investments in human and social capital um, and traditional and new communications tools are, are combined and wisely managed through participatory uh, and kind of active engagement of, um, of citizens, uh, of developers, of experts of varying sorts. The question we've been asked to tackle this afternoon, this morning, uh, is um, how might cities engage with developers, entrepreneurs, and specialists to deliver services through the app economy. We've got a great panel, I'm looking forward to debate. And we're going to start off um, this morning with Victor, um, who's the Open Innovation Ecosystem Specialist at the World Bank. And moving on to Jarmo Eskelainen from um, Forum Viljum in Finland, who some of you may have already heard speak uh, yesterday. We'll hear from Alvaro Oliveira, who um, uh, has, a, has a whole range of different uh, organisations and institutions involved in our let. Uh, all of the, the panels introduce themselves, and then Carlos Ferreira <coughs> will talk about his work with Dot Open around open innovation ecosystems. But in thinking about kind of the sense of platform, cities are platforms, cities as dashboards. What we thought we'd do this morning was rather than just sharing lots of examples of good practice, we'd um, get more value out of a bit of a critique of, of the notion of uh, cities as a platform. Each has been asked to talk for around five minutes, then we'll open up to a, a debate with the room as well. Maybe about the joys and the frustrations um, of trying to manage the work in this field. How can we ensure genuinely useful value is being generated in ways that are genuinely democratic, I think is the, the question we're looking at. Um, I came across a quote from uh, the well-known thinker and, and writer on all things internet, Clay Shirky, recently, that talked um, from a recent TED talk about um, the need to move towards greater transparency and open data in cities um, but to, to, to avoid this concept of platform or dashboard too much, his, his quote was, transparency is openness in only one direction, and being given a dashboard without a steering wheel has never been the core promise a democracy makes with citizens. So I'm going to kind of set uh, the, the kind of challenge to the team today to really comment on how far we've got towards genuinely new value um, and great access to this steering wheel. So Victor, over to you. Thank you. I'm going to start with a very brief introduction of cities as a platform, just to put uh, all the panel in the same concept, and also to give the concept to the audience. Um, as we are mixing here, a lot of people that have been working on this uh, for a long time, but also people that are learning about this. So to start, uh, I think the, the starting point here is to see the city as an ecosystem. Um, and this is something that seems very normal and very logical, but we haven't been operating like this uh, um, always. Usually, city governments have been uh, operating in a different way. What happens with city governments is the mayor get elected or appointed, and it has a program. It builds a team, and it tells the team, OK, implement this program. Uh, those teams start thinking about what are the priorities they want to implement and how to do them. They may have a little bit of surveys and some data, but it's usually incomplete. And they just think about it and start implementing. They start implementing the, the services and they get some data, maybe, <coughs> they meet like every year or every quarter at the most. And sometimes they don't know more until they do a survey or they get the next election, so the next appointment, or there is a demonstration because something is going wrong. Uh, so there is little interaction with the city in itself. Uh, it's, uh, it could be improved. So what we can have, it's a different kind of relationship. Uh, and this is possible because cities are starting to do it. 
an external relationship that involves the city more <coughs> since the beginning, since the creation of the services to the implementation. So basically, this is trying to do, to help the city do what you cannot do as a government. And this is a little bit what is the concept of a city as a platform, what you can provide a city government to let the ecosystem help you. Because there are many things you cannot do. You have a lot of constraints. You have constraints in budget. You have constraints in human resources. You have constraints of knowledge and data that you don't have. It's not on real, in the same real time that you would love to have. And you don't have all the aspects of the lives of your citizens that you're trying to help with. Um, so how can the ecosystem help the city government? I'll give you a couple of examples that we've been seeing in our work. Uh, most of it, it comes from Latin America. But uh, I'll start with something that we, we work with uh, a city government. When we start helping them, uh, we ask them, what are the main problems that your city has? Um, the main problems that came all the time were security and transportation. Uh, when we talk with our colleagues in the field from the World Bank, they told us the same, security and transportation. So everybody was in agreement. Then we uh, put that question to the public through a competition of cooperation. And what happens is 80% of the priorities were health. Big surprise. We never went into knowing that that was happening. But that was the demand that was coming. So that is giving us that working with the ecosystem will provide some information that we may not be so aware of. Um, the other example, that's also to put it practical, is um, one of the problems that the city, one of the cities were facing uh, was uh, public works. They have like 300 public works at the same time <laughs> going on in the city, but they only have four officials to look through the public works. So of course, there were delays, they didn't know about it, it, take, it took them like three months or four months to know that this was being delayed and to take action, so it was a process that only the big public works were being monitored on. On, on a time that allowed reaction, but the other small ones, the other small ones weren't. Those other small ones were very important for the neighborhood where they were happening. So what we did is using some technologies like mobiles to de develop a reporting system that was real time and to help the citizens, give them the tools, and they had the incentive because it was their public work that was going to improve the neighborhood. And what we got is all the citizens providing the feedback on real time and the four public officials were in front of a computer seeing on real time that monitoring of the public works. Complete change. The same resources, other kind of result that allows you to work with the ecosystem and to be more efficient. Um, so, so what is uh, the city as a platform basically is for the city to provide the tools uh, to the citizens to work with you and to the ecosystem to work with you, but also to facilitate that. But what do you need to do that? Well, first of all, you need to change the internal behavior of the city government. They are not used to do that. You are not used to work directly with the, with the citizens or with the universities and, and the private sector on, on these kind of uh, interactions. You may be uh, working with some private companies, you do concessions and things like that, but it's a different relationship. Uh, so. This is changing from the beginning through the co-creation of services to deliberately with the, with the citizens and allowing them to report, for instance, and be part of the service. That needs uh, the city government officials to understand this is a change. This is not usual business. And they also have to embrace it. That is difficult. And it's not easy. But without that, it's not going to happen. <coughs> the second thing we need to do as a city government is to facilitate, to help the ecosystem come together and provide them some tools like challenges, saying that these are priorities and, and, and work with me to do it, and help me doing it, and provide uh, some examples that this can be done, and build the trust. Of. And the third thing is to provide tools. We, we're going to hear in this workshop of a lot of tools. One of them is open data. It's not the only one, and you don't need open data by itself. You can, you can use many other things. You can start without open data. Actually, we started without open data when we work in Colombia. But you need other things. You need to do changes. You need to provide some basic, uh, maybe some basic uh, knowledge of the problem and they can interact with you. You can provide labs, like living labs. There are many other things that will allow to build community and interaction. So to end, what is uh, city as a platform? Um, as I want to look at it, it's, it's more on an attitude, an attitude of the city government to want to do that and an attitude of the ecosystem to react with you and to work together. 
it is a process because it's, it's a never-ending process. These interactions will uh, start somehow, then they will continue, but you need to continually iterate and, and test it uh, to nurture that ecosystem to work. Um, but what this is not about is only about technology. Technology, mobile phones, Twitter, as we saw yesterday with uh, Mexico, help you do that, make it possible. But it's the city government the ecosystem who will make it happen. And I finish the introduction here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. pick up on, uh, on your point really about the, the kind of priorities that uh, when you said the city and then the World Bank came up there two priorities and then health popped up as something that the, the citizens want. I'm interested to know what happened with that and, and whether that's uh, whether they dealt with health as the kind of priority from there on in or whether they had a different way of approaching citizens kind of moving forward. Well, what we basically were with uh, in Colombia was a process of <coughs> and starting to uh, uh, do these kind of interactions with citizens. Uh, in terms of health, what happened is most of the applications went there, so then uh, the, the health uh, departments of the cities are starting to, to take it and, of course, getting more um, kind of uh, known and priority within the government. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it, the important thing wa wasn't about changing towards health. It was more about changing towards we need to listen more and to continue doing this process. Yeah. And it opened it, and, and what uh, I take from that experience is now they are doing it by themselves with their own resources. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and we hear uh, just in the panel before uh, one of the cities, that was Manizales, uh, how it's doing it. The city government actually went beyond that and started doing challenges with education, with kids. And, and there is a very good example there of how the kids in the school are starting to work with the government uh, to, uh, to disseminate mm -hmm. uh, some, some of the things, but also to, to teach the rest of the community mm -hmm. about how the government works and how they can work. Mm -hmm. they, they, can, they can work together. Uh, so, I mean, that was a surprise to me because yeah, they yeah. took it by themselves and it was uh, a, an example that I hope we can hear about it later because it's, it's really yeah, nice. Yeah, I agreed. And I think your point about attitude really and this, uh, and this need to kind of pass on power, I think, is an important point I'd, I'd like to pick up a bit on uh, later on. So thank you very much. Yamo, over to you. And perhaps you. Um, I know you've talked, um, worked a good deal with the kind of living lab um, kind of network that uh, Victor mentioned. Perhaps we can also pick up on, on that as a, as a tool for some of this. But thank can you. we, uh, oh, sorry. Can we, uh, all right. The slides kill themselves as I should have because I don't have any, so. Uh, all right, hi, I'm Jarmo Eskelinen, CEO of CEO for Virium Helsinki, Helsinki-based innovation company or innovation arm of the city, and also the uh, president of the European Network of Living Labs. Uh, nice to be here, and uh, always challenging to speak a few times in a short couple of matter of couple of days. But uh, <laughs> I, have, I have a new topic again, so you won't be hearing any 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 old stuff. Uh, I want to talk about the uh, friction of. Uh, reliability and innovativeness, which is present in the idea of cities as platforms. And this is something, it's not my, my, my point, it's the point from the vice mayor of Helsinki who struggles with this constantly. How do you innovate in a city when you are supposed to pro provide reliable services for the citizens who expect it? How do you manage this friction? Uh, why it matters? I mean, why should we innovate in the first place? Well, first of all, if, if an organization doesn't innovate, it, it you know, dies. It, that's the way to renew what you do. So cities need to be develop uh, as same as any other organizations. And of course, from the business point of view also, there's more and more interest because the urbanization of the world, more and more interest in uh, cities as uh, business platforms, cities as... Uh, as uh, the places where you can solve through uh, different means the wicked problems that humankind is, is uh, facing. So there's lots of expectations for cities to help companies by being platforms of innovation and being the collaborators in this work. Uh, the other reason behind this, besides this sort of a corporate region or uh, problems of the region is the fact that the, uh, because of the modern technologies, modern tools, we can use participation and horizontal efficiency also in running the city services together with the city so that we get extra resources for how we manage the city. We can use sort of internet efficiency to provide the services of the city. 
but I go through some of the potential pitfalls and then some potential uh, solutions. First is a political pitfall. Uh, we hear the participation society talked about as an alternative for sort of public service society, public service field. That this sort of uh, city run by public services from public sector has sort, of, sort of failed. And now we have the alternative, which is the participation society. And that's not the case. The, uh, the fact is that participation adds on to the well-managed city. And it can replace some things which it doesn't, doesn't have to do anymore. But it's not like that was a failure and this is now uh, the right way to do it. And as a concrete example, when the uh, Finnish Cultural Foundation was uh, established in the 50s, now it's the biggest funding, funding body of cultural affairs in Finland. How they did it was that school children went door by door collecting money from the people to establish the foundation. It was a participation society of the analog days. They had little pots in which they collected the money and then they wrote the names in books which are still there in the Cultural Foundation. So well-functioning society has always based on participation. And it's not an alternative for, or, or reason to run down public services. Second is the uh, fact that lots of innovation is technology push. And technology push innovation is in quite strong contradiction with reliability. And uh, there are, uh, for, for example, case from the city of, uh, city, city of uh, Stockholm, I think, uh, a decade back or so, when they did quite large-scale pilot of video support for elderly citizens living in homes. And the internet wasn't there yet to actually do it. It was a technology dream, and the networks were strong enough, and the people who participated were really, really disappointed because it didn't work, it just didn't work. And even now it's totally doable. The uh, social services sector was so, should I say, backlash so badly because of it that they still don't do it, even though now it would be possible to do it. And that's very often the case when we want to roll out strong technology like pilots in the cities. How can we relieve the tension because they might not function yet as they should be? How can we tell the people that they are being tested? Third, uh, is the, uh, what would I call sort of from the bushes innovation model. That often we as developers, we go to the cities without knowing what the city strategy is. We put something that is incompatible with what they do. It might even work, but it's very hard to scale it up in the city because it came from the outside and it's not matched in the process, the city runs. And that leads to the death by pilot phenomena, which is all too familiar with, with us, you know. Things work as long as somebody puts money in it. After it stops, there's no follow-up or scaling plan or exit strategy. So I quit with the uh, thinking of what's the, what are the possible tools to ma ma manage these uh, threats, death by pilot, tech push, uh, disappointments, and politicization of innovation. First, uh, we need when we do things in the cities, we should check what the city strategy is and try to build up things so that they are compatible. And that's not that hard, that a hard thing to do. Most cities do have the strategy and you can get the top-down buy-in for what you do. Even if you do bottom-up work, it, you should have the top-down buy-in through some, some route. Second, for scaling up, we must be quite disciplined in working in the cities by using replicable models for innovation, dedicated environments or tools, dedicated processes, which are replicable from one situation to the other. And potential tools for this are uh, dedicated living labs, living lab environments or tool toolboxes for open data kinds of uh, processes, open data clearinghouse models, which are well-defined, understandable, which you can take from one department to the other and they, they Get it, get how it works. Uh, there should be tool, tools also for challenge driven procurement. So that when the cities want to procure innovation, they get tools to do it because cities are always, all, quite often norm driven and process driven. And we also have most of processes for this work if we wanted to succeed. And last and definitely not least, uh, when we work in the cities, it, it's, it would be good 
to try to build networks of change makers within the city, which is our home base, or between change makers in that city and other cities. Because change makers who make the city change are quite often alone. They are in, inside the organization, but they are loners because most people want to keep things as they are. And they are very loyal to you if you can give them peer support through connections to other change makers, which is something I think we could do through this kind of international context which we have here. We all know our change makers would be good to bring them together. And finally then, uh, we must be able to validate the success of what we do by combining a long-term strategy to iterative, small step, concrete innovation process. But when we do the small steps, the pilots, the little things in the cities, they should be linked to the bigger vision which we have of our city or cities in general. Thanks. Thank you, Jan. I just wanted to pick up on your, your, your point about the networks of, of change makers. I wonder whether from your experience of working in this field a little, whether you've uh, seen examples of where that's where that becomes very well networked and uh, have you got any recommendations for how this, the people in this room actually might, might do that quite practically? Uh, well, uh, I think we do have uh, some of those building up. Uh, one way to do it is uh, by making sure that in the process we run, like in the case of City SDK in our case, when we started it, we made, we made sure that the cities <coughs> as city organization are actually involved not only intermediaries. It's very easy to do a project which consists only of intermediaries and innovation actors, because we share the same mindset. But it's hard to take things from that, that realm to the real life unless we have the cities involved from the start. Mm -hmm. And that makes projects harder to build and maybe harder to run, but it lessens the threat of the best by far. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfectly, and I hope that'll segue quite nicely into Victor's piece, who and I think you wear so many hats as the intermediary, as the thinker, <laughs> as, the, as the, the, the startup in this space. So um, look forward to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank to the organizers for having me here to have this opportunity to share with you. And let's see where my presentation is. Somebody can help me. Some of the ads. <laughs> I have been one of the founders of these uh, Living Lab movements, and uh, I'm in. Jan is the president, I'm the married president, that means I have been in before, and uh, I'm responsible for the Living Labs uh, outside uh, Europe. And uh, all this uh, idea of the urban living labs led us also to the smart cities. I, I don't forget that seven, eight years ago we start thinking what better innovation uh, platform or ecosystem than the city. And that's when we start discussing with the, the, the Commission the possibility of testing and implementing some uh, pilot, um, pilot projects on this. Yeah. And uh, uh, I'm, st I'm starting with uh, the, 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 what we understand by human smart cities. We don't use uh, smart cities because today smart cities is too much uh, connected to the um, technology part, to the infrastructure, sensors, etc. Of course, we need the technology, but uh, what uh, we uh, really give our first priority is to people and involving people and solving problems of uh, people and uh, in our projects and projects uh, of uh, other people going on in, in, uh, in Europe. What we are trying to do is to understand the needs of people, ways to involve the people, and to co-design and co-create co co uh, solutions, um, solutions with, uh, with them. And that's why uh, we say that in human smart cities, 
the government itself is open. It does, is not a top-down. Certainly, it's a bottom-up approach, but with top-down support. But the government itself has to be open to engage and involve citizens' initiatives on the basis of <coughs> open and transparent, reliable relationship. And if you have this, you achieve trust. And if you have trust, you can have collaboration, participation, and all these uh, nice dream comes true. And uh, I can say comes true because there are good examples to come true. What we need is to devise how to scale what works in smaller projects. The government implements and supports an ecosystem of urban innovation, urban living labs, which applies to the co-design and co-production of social and technical, technological innovation services <coughs> and processes in order to solve real problems. We call this even a win methodology. We tagged already this. What means win methodology? Understanding the wishes, interests, and needs of citizens. And that's, I think, a good and easy way of expressing our methodology. In human smart cities, information technologies are used to solve social problems, economic, environment issues, focusing on the welfare and the happiness of people. It's the good of people and in, in the end, their own happiness. Yeah, we start uh, certainly and some, one of the projects that I will mention uh, <coughs> briefly is uh, around this, but most of the, our proje projects have, um, have this issue as a starting point. Today, our cities, we, are, we have social exclusion, even in the most advanced cities. I don't know my, my neighbor. Probably I will say good morning or good afternoon. And what we want to achieve is the picture on the right. Really interaction, human interaction, making cities more human. You, and of course, having in consideration also the sustainability. That's uh, the rationale, of course, we have the big challenge of the cities, but at the same time, we have technologies. Today, we don't need even to develop new technology. We have these, all these nice technologies, connectivity, uh, data, analyzing data, etc. And we have also, uh, and that comes from the social networks, a lot of uh, no openness and of people in order to collaborate, in order to share ideas. There are this culture is coming, and I sincerely hope that the young generation will do it e even in a more isolated form. And a few words about uh, one of these uh, projects, uh, my, my neighborhood. My neighborhood is exactly what I'm telling you. Taking a neighborhood in a city, or in several cities, in the case is Lisbon, Milan, Alborg in Denmark and uh, Birmingham, and recreating a neighborhood as they used to be, making the human interaction of people and devising with the people, with the citizens, what really they consider their priorities in terms of service, what they need, what are they get, what are they prepared to share, what they would like to have, and involving people. Technology is there, the platform is used to manage, to make communication, but it's a lot of hard work talking to these people, face-to-face -face, uh, face -face meetings, workshops, etc. And that we use basically the Living Lab to create this community to make them feel common interests, etc. And we use, because in many cases, these people, if you ask them the questions, they don't even understand exactly the implications of what you are talking about. We use a lot of design thinking tools in order to help them to extract from them their real perception of, and then they contribute. The code design thinking is extremely important in this methodology. And the, the third one is gamification. Once you get there, how do you keep the motivation of these people? And gamification is, the, to my knowledge today, is really the best to keep their interest. Of course, this, the results of this is we want 
they are on, at, at the bottom, platform, case, uh, methodologies, etc. And uh, as I said, a lot face-to-face -face meetings, a lot of uh, listening uh, to, uh, to these people. But don't forget that uh, trust is not an app and uh, mm. we need also to have uh, the top-down support. Some of the ingredients of this, uh, I go directly to this, openness, transparency, trust, privacy, and innovating the democracy. And I, uh, I must remember here that uh, it was in the 70s when I was my PhD, I was already involved very much on what we called it at the time, direct democracy. And then it came participa e participation, etc. And some of the service community uh, platform, of course, participatory budget is one of the easiest and more understandable ways of starting these services. People feel this is uh, for me, and they are empowered to share and take ownership of this service, because that's the trick. People feeling this is also mine, and I have done my contribution to it. Just a few words. Yes, about the, the democracy transformation. Some pictures, you recognize them from Brazil in uh, June. In Lisbon, when, about a year uh, ago, a uh, uh, demonstration, one million people on the street in 24 hours using uh, the social network Spain and the uh, Arab, Arab Spring. Uh, I take this mainly from my experience uh, in Brazil, but not only. What governments, cities, want to understand what really can, uh, can I do, because many were taken by surprise. And they have a platform, but what can I do with this? And the initial phase is, yes, social networks, we need to listen to the streets. And, but really, the, these two steps can be done immediately. Listen to the streets, looking at the networks, and enlarging bidirectionally the communication between the government and, uh, and the streets, the citizens. And that's uh, a, com a, a bit complex, but I can see different presentations fitting together here. It's not only the platform, it's not only the social networks. You need to create trust as soon as possible, and that's the city level. And the best example, one of the best examples I hear was the Mexic one described so well uh, yesterday, or Amsterdam, etc. That because do, even the way you, how those people are selected, because they need to have the trust of the government, they need to have the trust from the citizens, is part of the process of accelerating. A lot of, a, a lot of interesting comments um, that can be done about this experience. Of course, this is the Urban Living Lab. Now, what are we doing answering your previous question? We are making everything open, of course, including manuals that are online about the human smart city. We launched uh, a couple of months ago um, a network of human smart cities in Bologna that we hope to bring to these initiatives. We have about 70 cities there. If you want to join, you go online to Human Smart Cities, and there is uh, uh, the, the, all the, the documentation or the, the process to join some events that are taking place uh, about Human Smart Cities. This is the network. Uh, the green ones are the ones where myself I've been directly involved. That's last slide. <laughs> uh, as a conclusion, what are really human smart cities? Yes, as I said, use technologies, certainly, but as enablers, above all, involve people, engage people, establish this communication with people, and I think there is enough methodologies to show, and that's the best way, is to show good cases how this can happen, in order to use this methodology, as I mentioned, the WIN methodology, understanding wishes, interests, and needs, recreating a new sense of belonging and identity, leading to a better and happier society for everybody. I feel Thank, Thank you, you. <laughs> it's great to see.
great to see so many slides with arrows going in so many different directions, I mean, rather than this kind of pyramid that uh, yes. once was. <laughs> I just wanted to pick on one comment, really, which you sort of touching on in that second to last slide, really, about building out this network. And you mentioned the My Neighbourhood project in particular, and that there are four uh, sort of pioneering yeah. cities there. I just wondered, from your experience, what you found has been the best way for um, for other cities to learn from best practice happening in, in the, the, the cities you mentioned. Um, uh, exchanging of information and uh, real interacting exactly the way we are doing over here. I, I, I don't see. <laughs> Create some good dissemination uh, tools, it's important. Uh, we are working in some, uh, a, a book like that, uh, simple language, uh, targeting mayors is a good tool because they need to understand that this is part of their strategy and all also can buy votes, buy in the best way, uh, because uh, people feel that they are getting better services. Of course, if they are getting better service, they will reward that. They want to, uh, to have uh, uh, more of that. But I think it's basically uh, interaction, good tools, um, and uh, creating uh, good cases and thinking about how to scale. I don't think that just developing apps, etc., is the right way. It's a good way to show the tool, but we need to think how this can be integrated in uh, the strategy of the city and then follow it, uh, coaching these people, etc., in order that, that they can make. A good success, good profits, and pay taxes as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Carl, that's, that's your kind of work in some ways, isn't it? This kind of open innovation platforms to see some of the ideas, as well as working on some of the app, uh, app circus projects. So over to you to talk about Thank your, you. your work in this field. Thank you, Heidi. So let me see if I can pull up my presentation. We have only 10 minutes left. We'll be good. <laughs> no time to chat. We have been chatting. Yeah, <laughs> already. <laughs> we don't. Okay, so uh, I'll be really quick because I think that a lot of the things have been already spoken about. Um, I want to land a little bit all of this just just to the level of our experience because this was a lot about. I think the panel was about the city as a platform, but not only as a platform in general, but specifically for building apps and services. And and this we learn a little bit about. Mm, just about that open. We, we basically have been in the app business for, for a long time. We're really an open innovation company. So let's say that we've had enough experience to hopefully back up what we'll tell you about today. Um, as a mm, city, as a platform for creating apps, um, what we have learned is a little bit about stages. And, and the stages about building the ecosystem basically follow these three levels. The first one is basically reaching out to the community. The community is always there. It's not that the, you don't have a community in your city. You have a community in your city. Maybe you don't know them. Maybe you're not connected. Maybe they don't know each other. But the community exists. Um, we just did an event in Kampala two weeks ago, and we had 200 people participating. We did a, an event with the, with the World Bank um, in the Philippines, and we had 500 <coughs> participants. So the, they definitely have um, some presence. So it's about connecting. Hackathons and events are great for doing that. Also, app competitions. This is something that started three or four years ago and, and is still a useful tool to connect the community. Second is basically to build a good language. And there were some discussions earlier um, from, from our colleagues um, from Bogota, and they were talking about, about language and how important that is. Um, you need to interface with, with a community that basically comes from a very different background. Developers, creatives, um, people from the business space, they have a completely different paradigm. So creating that language is important. And change agents such as Code for America or Code for Europe that basically embed um, developers into the organizations in order to, to make some in internal um, changes, internal projects actually help with that. And finally, app incubation. This is what we do. It's basically how do we keep, to, how do we make this community actually build actual product for citizens? An actual product means a real app that solves a real problem. And that is our starting point, is we need actionable, inspirational problem statements, as Alberta was talking about. How do we talk, how do we get those problem statements to come from the citizens? So there's different ways of doing that, and, and Alberta was proposing some methodology. But in the end, the problems tend to be really big. They, they are sanitation, or 
transparency and democracy or traffic. And these are problems that are just too big. They are not inspirational because they are not actionable for a developer. I can't solve traffic in Cairo mm. as a developer. So how do I do that? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know. Um, build a subway system. I love that. Um, anyway, um, what, basically the methodology around building challenges is about breaking down that problem into something more concrete, like how do we address um, sexual harassment of women in public transportation? That's a real problem in Cairo. And women don't take the public transportation because of this problem. And you have more cars on the street. And that's something that is behavior driven. Apps are good at changing behavior. So anything that is behavior related can be addressed, potentially, with an app. So we have to break those problems to the things that people can change. Um, different environments provide different problem statements. Some of them may be generic, but you don't have the problem with sexual harassment on public transportation in Manila. At least not, that didn't come up. So it's important that, that we identify what, what are the relevant problems at each, at each city level. Even though, as, as Yarmo was mentioning yesterday, um, in cities are like old couples, and, and they all have the same problems, even though they don't think they do. Um, the second thing that you need in order to build a good app ecosystem is, is sustained support to build finished solutions. We call this incubation. In the end, what you will have is a minimum viable product using the Lean Startup methodology for those of terminology for those who know. Um, basically, a very basic product that has the conditions to actually succeed in the market or at least give it a try. So you need a finished product. Having prototypes is great. Having ideas is great. But they don't really get down to the, pro to, to, to the citizen level. And, and getting to that point is important because that's something actionable that cities can, can show. It's a result of the process. Um, we have a process of doing that, which we call Hack at Home. It's basically a three, four month period process in which we have um, basically mentors at a local level that are supporting the, the developers to, to, to build this. Um, there's also presential methods that can be used and that the bank has used as well. Um, to do the same at, at sort of an offline um, uh, level. It depends on how big you want to scale. With this process, you can, uh, you can, you can scale dozens of projects. Um, with, hand, uh, with offline processes, usually you can, you can incubate a handful, two handfuls of projects. Um, the, the last part that I want to talk about is basically the visibility. Visibility is important. Developers have one big problem. It's basically they build these great solutions and nobody knows about them. And this is a big problem. I mean, it's a big problem for me. I want to consume great apps and I can't find them. So how do, I, how do we connect them to the audience? Giving visibility is important by doing presential events, um, but also using the media. Use the media effectively. Use the media not only to communicate to the developer community to get participants, but also to the, the, talk to the, and use the media to communicate the initiative, the problem, to, to communicate about the solutions that are being pro provided at the end of the process, the apps and so on. And, and I, I don't want to leave the stage without saying a, a few things that we think are, are important to move forward. This has been our experience for 2013. And what do we think is relevant that we need to basically open up for discussion for 2014? And those are, let's, let's watch out for thinking that the, the, be, that the beginning is the end, OK? Um, mm, the picture with the developer may be not be the begin, the end of the process. I mean, for, for developers, this is now an opportunity. And, and we need to accelerate these, these projects in order to give them the, the real chance to succeed. So they need additional expertise. They need to build out their teams. They need financing. They need communication skills. They need all kinds of things that this core team that developed this project in four months, they don't have. So we need to work that out. Um, the second thing is that we need to have a demand side. So we need to drive smart citizenship, and that, for, from our perspective, is basically using the tools. I mean, we're all participants, but we're all consumers. So how do we drive usage of the tools? And this is an example of a, of a portal that we're launching this week for the city of Barcelona. It's called Apps for Barcelona. It is a, a portal that is expert-driven, and the experts basically evaluate apps for the rest of the citizens so they can find apps that are helpful for their life in the city. They are not made by the city. They are not even made in the city. 
They're just useful for our citizens. And they are citizens talking to others about what is the apps that are going to be useful for, going to be useful for them. Um, and last, uh, I, I think that one of the lessons that we have learned is that this scales very nicely. And it scales nicely in the sense that I think that having, um, um, having this uh, sharing can happen exposed. So we can have sharing like in the comments. So we're sharing the apps. And we're sharing our experiences. And we do things like we are here today. And we're all sharing. But sharing can also happen in real time. I mean, right now, we have the skills. We have the tools to make simultaneous projects happening in several cities at the same time. So we can have these actual these experiences that provide learning in real time for the city officials, and especially learning in real time for the developers themselves. It's a bigger market. It's very difficult for developers to make out their money, like you were saying, how to make a reasonable business with the size of just one city. So knowing that they can participate with other cities uh, at the same time um, is, is something that, that we think is going to be of tremendous value and something that we should push for in 2014. Um, um, just my last pitch, which is on Wednesday, um, we are running a workshop in the Smart City Expo, uh, inviting cities to basically uh, participate on this Smart Cities app program, which is a multi-city open uh, program for developing apps and hopefully uh, accelerating them afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. I just wanted to pick up, I think we've probably only got a, a couple more minutes, but um, I'd probably I'd invite you all to try to find uh, our speakers in, in the breaks to kind of ask the kind of probing questions I'm sure you're all got. I just wanted to just have one, one question, one quick uh, response from all of you actually would be interesting. To, to one of the challenges I get uh, given by my CEO quite often is it's great, this app's business is kind of scaling, there's lots of great stuff out there, but how can we, where, where are we seeing some real value? Where are we seeing the apps that are not your nice to have kind of moving around a city or engaging with the kind of tourist uh, infrastructure or whatever, where are we seeing things that really make the kind of difference to people's lives? I wonder whether you all could just speak, speak for like 30 seconds about the, your top app and your experience, maybe starting with Carla since you've uh, worked in this so, so much. Um, well, we have in, in, in different problems, we, we've had different solutions. In, in the Cairo traffic, just to give an example, um, the solution was basically how to find road assistance that is reliable. Um, in Cairo, basically, if your car breaks down, you just get out of the car and wait for your cousin to come and pick you up. Because you don't know reliable roadside assistance, and, and it's very difficult to get that information. So basically, the app provides that, mm, provides the ability to, to basically get the car off the street so the Great. traffic can flow. Yeah. Perfect. So Thank you. Avrara, do you have one? Yeah. Uh, I, I take yours as well the, from, uh, from this project, no doubt aspects of mobility are quite, uh, are quite important. Uh, but also uh, some uh, very simple civic services, like uh, um, helping to uh, manage um, uh, volunteer work, uh, supporting uh, children or supporting um, um, elderly people. Mm -hmm. Because these are the type, the type of services that people immediately feel uh, I can participate or I can take uh, advantage of it. And last one, participatory budget. I think it's an extremely important one to bring this community mm -hmm. together and to uh, narrow the distance between uh, the city governments and its citizens. Great, okay. thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, I think I gave mine away yesterday at the presentation, but oh, okay. I remind you of them. The uh, first uh, case, I think, is the uh, apps which support uh, global minorities or inclusion. And uh, the best one for that, which I've seen, is, is the Blind Square. Mm -hmm. Blind Square app for the blind people, which roams from city to city by running on uh, open street maps and being open okay. source so that it can be translated to uh, different languages. So it turns the uh, city experience into audio guide for the smartphone. Right. So uh, you, you can use sound when uh, yeah. as a blind person. Of course, that also can help travelers or tourists or you name it. So it's, it also scales outside of the original domain of blind people. And I think that's a good example of, uh, of a solution which is needed for all cities. Everybody wants inclusion, but it's very expensive to build city by city. Stockholm has done it, so we have a concrete proof 
that it costs millions to build a, mm. an app for the blind people for one city. But if it roams, uh, it, it's a business, it builds itself. Second, uh, which I think will be more imp also, also important in uh, exceedingly important in the future, is the transparency to the decision making system and the uh, uh, windows to the to the uh, to the city procedures. And for that, we there's a new app in Helsinki called uh, Ahjo Explorer, which mm -hmm. would turn the city decision making system into a searchable database for the smartphone. And that's also actually mostly used by civil servants and decision makers themselves. So mm -hmm. I would <laughs> make a prediction that the business to also the business intelligence apps for the cities will be a major new area here. Yeah. Not only citizen apps, but business intelligence for the cities themselves. themselves. Great, thank you. And Victor, have you come across the interesting one? Um, I would challenge ourselves not to think about apps. I think that's that's something it's old mm -hmm. right now because we have uh, Arduinos, we have 3D printers. Uh, let's think about prototypes. It goes beyond only software. You can have so uh, hardware too. And I would say the important ones are the ones that bring local innovation, which for me it's a problem that solves the local uh, the local problem. I mean, a solution that solves the local problem. So in Africa, that could be a, pur uh, a filter that purifies water. Mm -hmm. And they can build that with their 3D printer plus uh, some open source um, resources. So I would go beyond that. You can fabricate almost everything for your needs right now. Um, you have the tools. It's not expensive. Let's go beyond apps. Great. Great note to finish on. Well, I've got about a thousand more questions. I'm sure you all have. Please do take the time to find uh, our panellists in the, in the break. But we do have to move on to the next session now. But could you just join me in thanking uh, our four panellists for some fascinating discussion this afternoon? Thank you.